Morning, guys. I hope you're doing good. Welcome to part six of the beautiful irrationality dialectic or dialogues, however you want to see it, where we are trying to inquire about the nature of irrationality and see if we can find out something interesting about whether it can be beautiful. Today, I've been in contact with two professors, one called Keith Stanovich from Portland State University, and one, an old friend called Jim Doty, Dr. James R. Doty from Stanford University. We'll come on to the Stanovich stuff because that's just an email. But to begin with, I had a conversation last week with Jim about irrationality. Now, Jim has spent last 30 years operating on people's brains and trying to understand the science of compassion. I met him when I was thinking about empathy and action and how we use technology to build the relationship between those two parts of what makes us human. So it was interesting to try and bring this irrationality, rationality narrative to him and see how it computed. I'm going to watch back this conversation with you and make some comments along the way. So we're talking about irrationality and rationality. And what I was saying is that humans are irrational. In many ways, if you look at the history of economics, this argument that people make rational decisions is a joke because they don't. The very nature of being a human is accepting that you're an imperfect being and life runs on imperfection, not perfection. I agree with the sentiment, but this for me is a similar view to the behavioral economists who accept that this idea of homo economicus just isn't realistic, but yet there's nothing in what he said that would suggest that there is potentially something of value outside of rationality. Doesn't go as far as I'd like to go yet, at least. If you look at a depressed person who takes an antidepressant, it flattens all the emotions of life. And in fact, many of them stop taking it because there's nothing there. And if you perform perfectly rational, of course, then you simply become a robot. And that's not particularly interesting. I guess in a way, Jim's saying even negative experiences of value to some degree. The other side of it is I spoke of uh, effective altruism. And of course, this is the concept that when you are philanthropic, you should give to the entity that offers the most benefit to all. Well, again, that seems logical. Who is the decider of the beneficiary and what are the metrics they're using to decide someone's worth? That's where I think it fails. I've been to these effective altruism conferences and they're very clever at what they do, but it really doesn't connect with your heart. It's a very disembodying experience. This idea of rationality in general sounds great, but in practice, it isn't so great for uh, many individuals. It'd be great if we were actually good at it <laughs> and we yeah. were actually able to figure it out right and, and yeah. we had the framework to deal with it, but it's not that easy. I mean, frankly, uh, fundamentally, uh, a large percentage of the population are uh, only interested in their self-interest. And that's also true of countries. If we did not have to deal with borders, if we didn't have to deal with military clashes, there would be plenty of money for everyone to eat well, live well, be educated all over the world. Yeah, we don't have a resource issue. We have a distribution problem. We were not able to spending on the right things and getting it to the people that need it. My understanding of rationality is that what's baked into the heart of it is that it's about goals. It's about conceiving of a goal and then being able to sort of align your resources to achieve it or get close to achieving it. What I've noticed, and you know, when we first met, it was because I was running Givey, the donation platform. It was all about sure. trying to connect empathy and action, and, and it's about giving, and it's a and there's something about giving where you don't see the end goal for yourself because you you're you're giving away you can understand it and value it in different ways like how it makes you feel your sense of connectedness but it's not actually like a utility maximizer in the individualistic sense and broadening that out what I've been left with is when I left Givy and went to the woods I let go of all goals I wasn't trying to achieve anything I wasn't trying to make anything or build anything. I was just being for the first time in, in my life, really, other than in very short periods in prayer or worship when I was younger. So I feel like I left that realm of goal setting where you're trying to conceive of things to do and then go and achieve them. It feels to me that there's something about some forms of creativity where people report things just hitting them or they just begin speaking or begin painting without any kind of sense of where it would head or why they would do it. And this act of giving feels open-ended in the same kind of way. And I guess my question is, in the work of like empathy and compassion, do you see a connection between sort of compassion, empathy and creativity? And, and can you see these things showing up in the brain in a different way to when someone's doing something more 
rational in their kind of pursuit of achieving a specific goal rather than just trying to express and connect with the world. If their perception of what they're doing is to improve the lives of others, that affects the brain differently than if they're in a, a fear state that they're going to be judged by others. And that is the driver of their behavior. You know, there are two different things going on. You know, how you see yourself functioning in the world is the determinant of how your brain responds to that. So you're saying that maybe rationality doesn't have so much to do with what is determining of what shows up in the brain. It's more to do with whether you're acting out of fear or not. Correct. So this is a very interesting point. Jim is operating on a fear, love continuum. If I link in an old video I did with Jim about the vagus nerve and the parasympathetic sympathetic autonomous nervous system, you'll see what he's talking about in more detail. But this is fundamentally a different way of cutting the cake to the way that I'm thinking of with regards to rationality and irrationality. And I think that there's something in it. And I think Stanovich has some things to say about that as well. There was a study that you told to me a long time ago. If you set up a mechanism that rewards people for doing the right thing, mm -hmm. they actually become less compassionate because the motive of goodness and benevolence is now put into the context of money. So that's one issue. The other issue is that we know that when a person volunteers, as an example, a certain number of hours, this is a group of women over the age of 65 in this particular study, their life expectancy actually doubles compared to an age-controlled trial. What well, that yeah. means is that if you volunteer a certain number of hours for a certain period of time, you benefit because your physiology works much better than if you mm -hmm. don't. The exceptions though, are people who are doing these actions to be recognized, you know, to get a reward or to impress somebody. So again, this conversation about volunteers doing stuff to help others improves their life expectancy dramatically, which is no small thing. That is not making a comment on whether they can, were conceiving of those tasks, those things they were contributing in a rational or outside of rational or irrational kind of way. It's really just talking about the seat of their heart and their flight or fight response. When I'm saying I think there's stuff that lives outside of rationality, some of which is painful, some of which is people just chaotically unable to achieve the goals that they are trying to achieve. But I don't think that accounts for all of the stuff that's outside of rational behavior. I think there's another category or plane of life that we can access, like a higher plane of life, which for me is where pure inducted creativity belongs, which is where the true acts of altruistic giving and self-sacrifice come from. And I'm sort of seeing that there's two very different kinds of behavior sets that don't seem to live within that like middle lane of rationality, if you like, of setting out to achieve goals and then managing to achieve them. And I'm just wondering whether you see any basis for that. On some level, rationality uh, depends on where you sit in the picture of judgment. Let's say if you're a Wall Street, if you're one of those types of folks, <clears throat> your perception of what is rational is completely different versus a very spiritually evolved individual, right? Because a spiritually evolved individual would sit there and say, you know, nothing is more pure than going out into the forest, not having any distractions, so you can focus on your internal uh, self and elevate yourself to be of service. To that seems like a perfectly rational statement. And that being of service could be just, you know, to work in a food bank and you're giving to others. While the banker guy would sit there and go, well, this is a waste of time. How logical is that? Because if he worked 100 hours a week, he could make enough money to give away to help all of those people and still live in a huge mansion and have, quote unquote, everything. And both of those are logical arguments or rational arguments but they're far, far different. So I think rationality is in the eye of the beholder in that context, but irrationality is confusing because it doesn't follow a logical path of how you should behave. I don't know if I'm saying it right yet, but I think there's two parts to any moment. One is the planning and therefore the potential for an argument to be constructed that is convincing to determine your action. The other is how you behave in that moment. 
And obviously, in a sense, you could break it down. If you break life down into moments, you could say that every single moment it has the potential to be the preparatory planning stage of the next moment and the active moment in question as well. And that life is made by this sort of interlinking of the chain of moments that happen through life. I think there's a question of who sets the goals or not and where do they come from? You know, if you go out and you get drunk and you lose your job and then you run around and you're trying to get another job and you get drunk again and you lose your job, you know, that's irrational. And it's just, it's pointless because it's not accomplishing any goal. It doesn't have an endpoint of elevating yourself. Irrationality is not having a clarity of focus or intention while rationality has clarity of focus and intention but that clarity and uh, of focus and attention can be diametrically different in each person's perceptions. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. So Jim thinks that rationality and non-rationality is simply an issue of clarity and intention. When I'm talking about things that might be beautifully irrational, yes, you could say there's, there's not clarity and there's not clear intention. It doesn't hold the conditions that potentially lead to high notes emerging in high regard. Again, it sets the pejorative sense that clarity and clear intention are the highest object. And I think in terms of matters of the heart, that could be true. But I don't think it explains about how to value the methods of engagement that occur outside of that which we call the rational method. These are deep weeds. I mean, we're getting to the to the end of what we know about these parts of life. I just want to hear what you're thinking next. So you did your wildly successful book, Into the Magic Shop, and then it's been teaching through lessons from the magic shop. Obviously, you've got all loads of other streams of work, but on that train of thought and yourself and your personal narrative, what's what are you creating next in that direction? I'm doing another book called Out of the Magic Shop, The Power of Intention. It looks at it slightly different because it talks about the nature of the shadow, uh, how that negatively affects your perspective and your ability to manifest. You know, it's not like the secret. In fact, this some way relates to rationality. You know, the Mm. secrets about, you know, if you focus, the gods will open and you'll get lots of money. This is not about that at all. This is about how your psychological state impacts your ability to properly put things into your subconscious to manifest Mm. things that are helpful for you. And in some ways, it's a conversation about understanding what you think you need is different than understanding what you truly need. To be honest with you, that conversation with Jim was a little bit jarring for me because his language set around compassion, fear and love and intention just felt like it was square peg circle hole on some of the conversations I'm having. And that's been sitting with me for for a number of days. Meanwhile, I found two incredible lectures by a guy called Keith Stanovich that I mentioned. One of them is about rationality and one of them is about rationality and intelligence, which piqued my attention because that's the area I've done most work in. And what him and his crew are basically saying is that someone's intelligence score doesn't say anything about their rationality score. And your rationality score is what sets the boundaries and the goals to put your intelligence to work. And I think that in a strange way is a little bit like what Jim is saying earlier. How people are in the world, how their heart is, determines what they think is rational. And that determines in turn how they set about to use their intelligence. In a way, I think you would probably see it as a hierarchy. Stanovich is standing on top of intelligence saying, yeah, but rationality and measuring how rationality works is what sets the scene for intelligence. And Jim would be standing on top of Stanovich saying, yeah, but it's your heart and how you see yourself and your compassion that sets the scene for rationality, which sets the scene for intelligence. I kind of see it a different way because I think that ultimately there's this beautifully irrational space. And so yesterday it all kind of came clear to me in a way that I hope, I really, really hope I can guide you through. And I'm going to try and use my whiteboard, I think. I'll put Stanovich's lectures in below. I sent him an email saying, I mean, this is what I love about academics is that they're, they, they're really nice and they tend to get back to you. 
Hey Keith, really interested in your work. Watched a bunch of your lectures. I have a YouTube channel with 60k subs and looking at irrationality and if it can be good, even beautiful and distinct from the painful kind of irrationality that we seem obsessed with. If you suggest a time, I will send and invite. Cheers, Dave. And he replied and said, Dave, thanks for getting in touch. I'm really a print guy rather than an oral guy. I'd be happy to try and answer some questions via email. Keith. And this doesn't actually surprise me because a lot of his previous work was in the art of reading and the value of reading and ingesting knowledge through that medium. So I might imagine that he even thinks it's better to do it in written. Now, this has been an interesting challenge for me because obviously I am an oral person. I like talking and doing things in conversation. But I'm noticing that I'm feeling very nervous about framing questions for Keith because I want him to judge me based on the quality of my questions. I want him to see me as a collaborator and not just as some random that's asking some emails and, and that'll be that. Yeah, I'm going to do a summary of what I perceive Keith's work to be and then show you how I think I've combined it in my mind with Jim's work and see if it makes any sense at all. Okay. Okay, so this is how I think the layout works. You have this sort of economic theory of homo economicus, right? Oh, you can't see that very well. The field of behavioral economics happens with Daniel Kahneman. And he says, actually, we're not fully rational. We actually use heuristics to shortcut. And basically 90% of what we do is subconscious. And it's what he calls system one. And it's easy and it's quick and it's efficient and it's awesome. And then a small percentage of what we do is done in system two which is the conscious mind. It comes out of the frontal lobe, this newest part of our brain, and it allows us to, you know, really do what we now describe as rational thinking, and that's given birth to the enlightenment and the scientific endeavor. But then our man, Stanovich, comes along. He basically says there's two parts to it. There's the algorithmic process, and there's the reflective process. The unconscious script that's running, the algorithm that's running round and round in our system, often leads us to irrational choices that aren't necessarily good for us because we're not checking in, we're not micromanaging every little decision that we're making. But then you've got Jim's work, which is causing me a problem, right? Because you've got his fear. So Jim's interested in a whole different cross-section. Whereas I'm thinking, I don't quite know how it shows up in the amygdala, but I know that it's expressed in the vagus nerve through the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. So my question is, if you put Kahneman on this line of system one and system two, now we've got a map for experience. And if you think that Stanovich's work is delineating between the algorithmic and reflective processes, I'm not sure that it's right to put it this way, but I will for today because it's as far as I've got. But if you were to put the algo stuff here and the reflective stuff here, I would imagine in the bottom right corner here where we're talking about sympathetic nervous system activated with high algorithmic system two processes activated, that this is where you get mental health problems. This is the, the overthinking quadrant. Currently, I'm not aware of anybody attempting to make the same delineations that Stanovich is making within the system two. I'm interested in making a delineation here in system one between painful and beautiful irrationality. This is the valuable part of human experience and engagement that I think just hasn't been looked at properly. And for me, the important part is, this is where creativity, where sacrificial love, basically what it means to be a hero, what it means to be a fucking legend, all lives up here. This is the life that we can aspire to that's the exciting wild adventure of life and if it accidentally gets thrown in with painful irrationality missing the mark of behaving rationally then what's the point in any of this and so for me i care a lot about this and this is what choked me up there may be someone who's done work on delineating this it might be true this is art what i'm showing you now is art it's a way of putting this story together it may not be accurate but it's a, a way of continuing to move this conversation forward if somebody is activating the parasympathetic nervous system so acting effectively in love and love comes from a sense of safety and they're able to drop into a system one subconscious 
not goal orientated, not overthinking kind of state, then I think that this is what can lead to beautiful rationality and leads to exponential moments of creativity, of sacrificial love, of being struck by lightning and bolstering ultimately an imagination of how to live because instead of being informed by the immediate stimulus you're being informed by that which is grown elsewhere and there's a deep amount of trust here to trust that this is not that so to put it in the language of cognitive science i'm interested in seeking a delineation between system one processes when parasympathetic nervous system is activated and system one processes when the sympathetic nervous system is activated. And so my questions to Stanovich are really to do with, do you know anybody that's done work here? Have you looked at the relationship between the amygdala and the frontal lobe? Do the behavioral science people even look at charts of the brain or do they look at it in demonstrated behavior? That's probably enough for today. Guys, have you got any thoughts, any papers, You know, this is just some sketches of the way that it's turned up in my brain. I'd love to know what you're thinking. I don't know if you can see any of that anyway. Be pleased to connect. Let's keep talking about it. It's an interesting and potentially very valuable thing. I think ultimately, if we can get to the bottom of this, there's some things that we can say back to the world of arts and back to the world of religion. Anybody that's interested in the stories of love and creativity, I am in defense of absolute exponential creativity and reckless sacrificial love. Not to live in those places constantly. It would be like you don't want to live in one big orgasm. It's just far too exhausting. (laughs) But we want to hit those high notes of life. I want to make sure that everybody has in their conception of what it means to live a life, that we're trying to take our natural tendencies, become conscious of those which are not serving us, get strategic about how to make our lives good and safe for those in our families and those around us and others. And then in that safety, reach for the high notes, reach for something more, reach for moments of that creatrix amorum, those beautiful moments of irrationality that make life worth living, that bolster the imagination and create a path for others to tread on. Feels pretty good. Cheers. I hope you guys have a great day. I'm feeling pretty pumped. Take care of yourselves and see you soon.